to have the one great chance to talk to Michael Bate, uh, a fellow fellow, but one never seems to have the time really to talk. So, Michael, where and when were you born? I was born during the war in Epsom. A, um, it was a long war, so which year was it? The uh, 21st of December 1943. One day apart from me. Yeah. Really? Well, 20th of December, but two years earlier I was. Oh, <laughs> Good. Okay. In Epsom. In Epsom, yes. Yep. My father was, a, my father was um, away. He was in the RAF. And I'm not quite sure how we came to land up in Epsom. Um, before my birth, they'd been based on bomber stations in Lincolnshire and places like that. But anyway, we, we, we landed up in Epsom. And I have a vague memory of my father returning, looking extremely yellow, from Burma. Um, was he in the Gurkhas by any chance? No, 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 he was in the RAF. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, was, I he was a doctor, mm. so he was involved in the repatriation of uh, prisoners from Burma. Um, but I have, apart from that, I have absolutely no recollection of Epsom. It's just something yeah. that's on my passport, and uh, that's mm. the end of it, I think. So. Tell me something more. As far back as you'd like about... Did you know your grandparents? For instance? Yes. Um, I didn't know my... My, my, my parents' families were very different. Um, I think the thing they had in common was that they were pious. Um, <laughs> so they both had um, quite strong religious senses. My grandfather, on my father's side, whom I never knew, he died, I think, in about... 42. Um, he was the Dean of York and came of a Methodist stock and had then um, come back to the Church of England as a young man. Um, he married a very feisty Scottish woman um, whom he met here at Morden, as far as I know. Um, and they must have made an interesting couple. He was intensely scholarly, apparently. Bate, um, his name. Bate, yes, yeah. his, uh, yes, his name was Bate. Was he an uh, author? Uh, was he an author? Mm. Yes, he was a prolific author, right. on, um, particularly on St. Paul, mm. um, on church issues and on ecumenical issues as well. Mm. He was very keen on that sort of thing. Um, his wife, Isabel, who I knew as, as, as a... Uh, delightful and caring grandmother um, until she died I think in the 70s um, she was I think a perfect foil to him probably uh, she was she was mischievous and, and rather strikingly beautiful and uh, I think he must presumably have fallen for this uh, striking young woman in Cambridge. I don't know. I really don't know. Perhaps I'm building a myth in it. I don't know. But on the other side, my mother's family was completely different. Um, and uh, I think there must have been a sort of tension there between the two families. I certainly remember um, my paternal grandmother being very dismissive about my maternal family. Um, so on, on my mother's side, they were rather grand. Um, so they, uh, they, they had houses in, in London and houses in the country. They had a very large estate in South Wales, which my cousin still uh, owns. And there was, a, there, was, there was a feeling of sort of... Um, Put it, there's a sort of slightly romantic feeling about them. Um, what was the name? Bosinkit. Oh yes. Yeah. So they were they were they were I were mean they earls or something. No, like they weren't earls. No, 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 they weren't that grand. <laughs> they were they were they were Huguenots mm. who'd um, emigrated uh, to England in, uh, after the massacre of Saint Bartholomew, mm. I think, and uh, became very successful in London and then bought their estate in for some reason. In South Wales, um, Herefordshire, no, Monmouthshire, and so there was this grand house which was falling into decay, and as children we could go there and run riot, um, and mm. we did. Um, 
And I remember my maternal grand, uh, my paternal grandmother um, coming to visit for some reason and looking at it as she came up the drive. She looked at this huge uh, Georgian house and she said, Boh, looks like the workhouse, she said. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually not far of the mark because it was extremely dilapidated and sort of mm. green and mossy. Mm. Um, but um, so my, my mother's father I knew, my mother's mother I knew. Um, he was a, a, a judge, um, and she uh, she never. I mean, this this sounds pejorative, but it isn't. Mm. She never had to stir a finger for herself. Mm. So they had servants, they had a butler, they had they had a, they had gardeners, they had chauffeurs, and. Um, gradually these things fell away, so I never knew the butler, he'd gone by the time I arrived. But the gardeners were still there, and the most wonderful man, the chauffeur, Mr Bray, who, who became gradually sort of somebody who did everything, having been the sort of uniformed chauffeur in their grand car, he became the man who kept things running. Um, uh, and I don't quite know how I got on to talking about Mr. Bray, but he, he was desperately important in my early life as somebody that I tagged along with. Um, mm. And he would just take me along as his mate on various enterprises. Um, um, oh yes, of course, my grandmother. Uh, she, having come herself from quite a grand background, had never had to stir a finger. And uh, then gradually changed into... Um, my grandfather died in, in the early 50s and she became, she became a woman who uh, was um, very aware of her social responsibilities and sort of ran a family planning clinic in Newport and actually packaged up the condoms on the library table in this big oh. house mm -hmm. for distribution. Um, and I think she all, I, I believe actually in her youth, she was, she was actually... An, uh, 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 a Fabian, certainly. Um, but anyway, this came out later in, in her later life to some extent. Although, despite the fact that she now had to feed the chickens and make do for herself, um, she was not very good at the sort of domestic things. Um, so, very different from... And her name was supposed to came uh, after Mary. After Mary, she was an Anson before that, mm. so so she 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 became both a kid. Um, mm. And uh, as I say, these, these these families were very different, but they were united by this sense of piety, uh, which I don't think it's too strong a word. I mean, my father's father was the dean of York, and and and. Then a great uncle on the other side was was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and there were there were there were sort of divines going back into the dark, including an interesting woman called Mrs. Fletcher, who was a Boson kid and who used to sort of haunt us. She was she was a she too was an early Methodist, and her portrait hung sort of darkly in the billiard room <laughs> with a with a sort of what appeared to us to be the habit of a nun, but must have been the habit of an early Methodist. Mm. And it was just Mrs. Fletcher, and we used to shudder as we went past this, this desperate figure <laughs> hanging on the wall there, I remember. But, but there was that thing that united the two families, and probably that's what brought them together, my mother and father, I don't know. Were, they, were they your parents also pious? Um, they weren't exactly pious. They were certainly um, committed to a very conventional sort of religion. Mm. We went to church um, and uh, we rebelled in adolescence and um, felt that we were a disappointment to our parents. And when I say we, my sister and I, then there were two of us, um, we both rebelled sort of simultaneously. At what age did you rebel? Uh, well, I began rebelling because I found Sunday school so incredibly dull and tedious and boring. And, and uh, so I began to rebel when I was six or seven. Mm. But it, it culminated in, in not going with them to church, which was the sort of mm. ultimate rebellion, really, mm. in this sense. Uh, I suppose when I was 15, 16, something like that. Um, 
I, I usually ask people about mm. their religion, particularly mm. the relation between science and religion. Yeah. Um, I, it's been very interesting talking to mm. astrophysicists and mm. cosmologists about this. Mm. Um, and they usually say that, although they don't you know, subscribe to any particular religion, they might be, they have a sense of the mystery, the kind of Einstein sense of the mystery. Mm. Well, what what is has been your religious uh, well, philosophy through life? Um, it's rather a heavy question. You can take no, it's 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 obviously an interesting question, and it's one that I reflect on. Um, where does one begin? Um, well, I, I think I mentioned to you some time ago that I went on the pilgrimage to Santiago. I, I, mm. We talked about walking mm. yeah. and how, what a sort of revelation the discovery of a long walk had mm. been. And at the beginning of that, um, you were asked, um, when you get this credential, whatever mm. it is, you were asked why you are making the pilgrimage. And uh, there are various options, one of which is that you're doing it for spiritual refreshment. And it seemed to me that that exactly fitted the bill for why I was doing it. And in the event, it turned out to be true. It was deeply, spiritually refreshing. And uh, I do seek for spiritual refreshment. And so... I, I acknowledge completely that there is a mystery. There is, of course, a deep mystery. And we fool ourselves completely if we think that there is not. Um, and I, 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 I also feel that that mystery is less apparent to people. And this may be wrong. Of course, it can, it can be complete rubbish. But I feel that the, the mystery is less apparent to man in the 21st century, at least in the Western world, than once it was. Um, and I think that that is a great pity. So now I'm sort of tiptoeing around the question of religion. I, I don't subscribe to a particular religion. I don't. And I, like my maternal grandmother, actually, who refused to say the creed because she couldn't bring herself to say things that she didn't believe in. Um, we were deeply shocked at that as children. <laughs> um, uh, so, but on the other hand, that um, I can get very engaged and interested in um, in conversations about how. Um, the sort of religion that I was brought up with um, could actually change to become something that one could actually um, feel, I, I won't say comfortable with because that is not what I want, but something that one could feel at ease with. Um, and I, I, an instance of uh, such a conversation was a man called um, Richard Ackland, who uh, was a sort of socialist pacifist person, who gave a series of broadcasts about religion, which I found deeply inspiring and interesting. Um, he's he's actually my he he was actually my grandmother's cousin. Um, uh, so there's a sort of there's a sort of that, that's another aspect of the piety of this family. I think the Acklands were, mm. were quite quite important to them. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's a deeply unsatisfactory area of my life, really, because I feel... Well, I feel that, the, that I don't have enough time for... Or I don't know, that's not true, I do have enough time, but I don't make enough time for reflection. And I think that that sort of religious um, experience that I value 
most. Um, but I think what somebody like Richard Ackland would say probably would be that that's all very well, but there must presumably, if you're talking about some kind of Christian aspect to this, there must be some there must be some kind of action as well as reflection. Um, I just follow up with mm. two questions. One is, mm. you said that in the 2040 and the 21st century it was mm. less obvious that there was mm. a mystery. Um, quite a lot of the scientists I've talked to who seem to know Richard Dawkins, mm. you get on to Richard Dawkins. I mean, his view, which was quite widespread in the 19th century, which is that science and religion talk about the same things and science has disproved religion and therefore we should drop religion. It sounds as if you wouldn't be entirely sympathetic with that. Well, I'm glad that that, that that comes through, because it's entirely the way I... I mean, that, that, that's exactly right. I, d I don't agree with that mm. at all. I think that... Um, I mean, I, I actually find Dawkins um, often extremely invigorating mm. and, and, and somehow encouraging and positive to listen to and get engaged with. But I really feel that he does himself and, and everyone else a, a disservice by being so categorical and, and in my view, so wrong hmm. about certain things. In particular, his, his, his view that, that science has, has disproved religion. Hmm. And I think that's completely, completely hmm. wrong. And misses so much that is uh, important and, and of interest. Uh, I mean, I, for some reason, the thought flashes into my mind that, that, that actually, I mean, if I wanted to have a really stimulating conversation, then I might prefer to talk to Rowan Williams than to, to Richard Dawkins. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. The, the second question is, you mentioned reflection. Um, mm. If it sounded as if you would find things like some of the Eastern mystic, mystical religions, particularly, obviously, um, Buddhism and mm. um, practices of reflection, like mm. Zen Buddhism and so mm. on, attractive, because mm. that's really what the spiritual refreshment you want mm. is from, mm. letting your mind mm. rest and mm. contemplate. Have you ever shown an interest in any of them? No. And that probably is part of what I meant when I say I don't make time mm. for that. Mm. Um, I can say one thing about um, an Eastern religion which I have encountered, which is, which is Hinduism. Mm. And that I find, I think, almost repellent. Mm. Um, I really can't stand it. Um, and that's pr partly ignorant. And uh, that has to be... I mean, it is puzzlement, actually, as well as re re feeling repelled. Because, because, because I'm puzzled because some of the most pious Hindus that I know are, are, are delightful and admirable to an extent that's almost unimaginable. And yet they subscribe to this religion that I find... <laughs> too much blood and, <laughs> and confusion. Too mm. many, too many gods. I think your mm. your particular background wouldn't suit you to Hinduism. No, quite probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's go on with your life then. Mm. Um, do you remember anything about your first school? Um, Actually, I should go back. Your parents. Yes. You, you haven't really talked about their personalities. Um, Oh. And how they might have influenced you. Did they encourage you a lot in your life and work or Yes they did. I mean though I, I I mean I had an extremely stable and uh, loving uh, upbringing. I was very fortunate indeed. Um, my father my father I mean they're both they're both dead now. Hmm. Uh, my father was um, uh, I think something that we didn't realise when we were children, I think he was a very scholarly man. Um, this manifested itself in, in later life, in particular. He sort of became 
finer and more sort of intellectually sort of um, engaged and the, the older he became. He was a doctor, he was a pathologist. Um, I think he'd had um, a particularly dreadful experience in the war um, uh, on a bomber station and it may be, I don't know, but it may be that that drove him away from uh, something like general practice and dealing with patients um, and into um, what was much more a laboratory based doctoring. Um, so he was um, fairly stern, um, very loving, um, utterly reliable. So um, Say about him. That gives a picture. Yeah. And your mother? My mother, my mother was rather different, and uh, she was a musician, so she was a viola player. And um, I suspect my sister feels quite strongly about this that that she had um, suppressed her own ambitions as a woman um, to to bring us up and be a, a loving wife to my father. Um, and certainly, she she, um, she 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 did all of those things very well. She was also extremely loving. Uh, I think actually one very interesting characteristic of both of them was that they were pretty antisocial. Um, um, they 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 found entertaining and dealing with people very tiresome um, and difficult. Um, so I think that we formed, and I think that this has had consequences for my sister and myself, a very tightly knit and easygoing family unit within which things worked. And because we were, I mean, we were very happily placed. We had, you know, we had a house in the country that we could go to. We lived in London, not um, actually in pretty, pretty, pretty. Um, Actually, our houses, houses in London were not perfect by any manner of means. Our, we, we lived in, in North Kensington when it really was North Kensington. Mm. And, um, but um, but um, uh, uh, now, now I've lost secluded, the secluded, yeah. a kind of enclosed inward looking. Oh, family. yes, 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 indeed. Uh, they were, that was I got onto the idea of them being very antisocial, which mm. which indeed they were. Um, but my mother was um, intensely artistically inclined, so she she played the viola. She loved the viola, and um, she played the piano. And in later life, she took up silversmithing, and she painted. And so she did all of these sorts of things in a fairly um, amateur kind of way, except for music, which was desperately important to her. And one of the real, really awful things that happened to her later in life was that she had a, a series of strokes. And one of these strokes um, was just removed at a stroke. It removed her interest in music, just like that. Bang gone. Awful. Awful for those of us who remembered her as being so engaged with her music. So that was tragic. And in, in fact, um, I suppose one's, one's recollections of one's parents, at least if, you, if they live as long as they do as they did in my case, is coloured very much by the way they die. And my mother died horribly. Um, she had a series of strokes. And by that time, my parents were, had gone back to Monmouthshire. And they were living in a bungalow in London. And she had a series of strokes. And um, finally, and on, on the day when I was there, she had her last stroke. And it didn't kill her. And she was taken to Abergavenny Hospital and she um, 
never recovered the power of speech. She never recovered the power of swallowing. She could never drink again. She could never feed again. She could never speak again. And yet she lived for another two and a half years trapped and frustrated, manifestly frustrated. And I, 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 that, that I find is, is, is awful. awful. And actually, it reminds me of one of the things that, that I've always found very difficult about Christianity, which, is, which Bergman actually mentions in, I think it's in Winter's Light, where the sexton, I think, and this may be wrong, the sexton of the church concerned is a cripple. And he says at one point in the film, they go on about the crucifixion and about the way he suffered. But I've suffered all my life, far worse than he ever did. And what kind of redemption does that bring? And I feel strongly that my mother suffered horribly before she died. And I see no virtue in that, whatever. Um, and it diminishes the impact of the crucifixion for me. Um, but that's, uh, that's by the by. But anyway, her life um, was, and I think manifestly to her children, um, the opposite of my father's. She was... She was fey and skittish and artistic, where he was reliable, um, level-headed, perhaps scientific. Um, and uh, so um, I think all the time one sort of thinks about oneself and thinks which of these aspects have come out in me, um, and, uh, and 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 in, in a way, it sort of reinforced the feeling we had about these two families. That on the one hand was the the, the clerics family, uh, come up from very respectable, very um, uh, sort of Methodist beginnings, um, and and doing good works and becoming doctors and things like that. And on the other hand, was this very strange family, sort of rather grand and money, all sorts of high-flown connections in this wonderful old house, decaying away in the countryside. And so we were sort of constantly sort of oscillating between these two. Did you feel this contradiction and mm. tension in your own personality, do you? Um, yes. I wouldn't yes, describe I you as skittish from the little I know. <laughs> you wouldn't? <laughs> well, I don't no. know well enough. Well, not. you see, I, I know enough about myself to know that there is that in me. Mm. Um, and in fact, in many ways, I think I'm much more like my mother than my father. Mm. Um, I'm certainly from the point of view of looks. I am. Mm. Um, uh, I don't know, but I mean, I feel my father and myself all the time as well, so hard to know. Coming back to mm. something I usually ask a bit mm. later, but you mentioned your mother's love of music. Mm. Did she impart this to you? Is music been important to you? It's very important to me, but uh, unfortunately, um, okay, what should one say? I mean, I am quite musical. I mm. love music. And actually, as I grow older, I begin to be, um, I begin to spend more time with it. But um, as a child, they struggled in vain to get me to persevere at an instrument. So first of all, I tried the piano, of course. And I was wrapped over the knuckles by Miss Sturgis, I remember generally got fed up learning the piano and thought I was no good. Then I moved on to the cello and I 
couldn't bear the sound of myself abusing the cello, so I got rid of that. we got rid of that. Then I moved on to the clarinet, um, and in the end, couldn't stand that either, <laughs> and so on. And uh, of course, and, and I, I uh, it's a cliche, but I do regret it bitterly. Yeah. I'd love to be able to play the piano. Um, what kind of music do you more and more love, or has it changed? Obviously, changed over. Well, time. it's changed a bit. Because there was a time when I I I would I would only listen to um, Bach really. I mean I was just mad for Bach. Um, but uh, much more. I mean interestingly, I'm much more Catholic now. I mean I I I love Brahms, um, and and I I went. I mean I I also love Britain uh, enormously. Um, so uh, there are a few things that I there are a few things that I that I find that I find unbearable, and I couldn't probably put a name to them. But but um, uh, you mean unbearably awful or do you unbearably mean? awful? No, no, I mean unbearably awful things that I really don't want to listen to. Hmm. Um, one of the I mean one of the delights of Cambridge and Kings is the music. Hmm. It really is. Wonderful, um, but I think my mother must have despaired of me because I mean she knew that I could, if I tried, not play an instrument but break through to some sort of serious understanding, and I just feel that I'm on the edge of that now. Um, and again, it's it's a question of taking the time to do these other things. Do you? Does music have any relation at all to your work? I mean, some people work to music. No. Some people fi find themselves inspired by music. Others see analogies between complex music and mathematics or whatever it is. Has it been just a way of relaxing? And no, I don't think it... I, 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 when I was a PhD student I, in Cambridge, I, I lived in um, a flat in Petty Curie, places, um, with a group of people, one of whom was a man called Hugh Horton, um, and Hugh was a very passionate Irishman, deeply into Wagner, and Hugh raged at the idea that you could listen to music and do something else at the same time. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to listen to music and do something else. Mm. I want to listen to music, try and understand it, try to be within it and somehow appreciate it and love it. And, mm. Well, not necessarily love it, of course. Um, mm. Yeah. You're still about six years old at the moment, but um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's yes. take you to your first school anyway. Do you remember anything about your first school? Was it in London or no? Um, by that time, they'd moved us to Homebury St Mary in Surrey, and we lived in an idyllic little cottage called Cherry Tree Cottage, um, where my first memory, my sort of first real memory, is is of digging a hole in the ground and being frustrated by a brick a red brick that appeared at the bottom of this black hole and the midges beginning to bite and the blackbirds singing and the frustration of the brick in the hole. Was, uh, that, that is something that I know happened. Um, How old were you? I must have been very young. I must have been probably four or five, I don't know. But I have, I mean, I have other memories going back further, um, uh, which one of which is striking but perhaps is, is, is not real. And that is of an air raid um, where, I mean, I could only have been uh, two at the most. Um, and no, I couldn't, scarcely, I couldn't have been two. It must have been, it would have to be one. Um, but I do remember going down a staircase, being carried down the staircase. I can see myself being carried. Um, and my mother saying, go and get a blanket, 
to the woman who was our nanny. Um, and that is my very earliest memory. Um, but that's all. Um, but the school. Um, we went to a school, a village school called Cockers Hill. Um, and all I can remember there is being, in a very gentle way, taught to undo my flies and pee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I really, I really don't remember anything else about Cockers Hill except that. It's um, a pretty useful life well, it was, skill. It was indeed. But from there, which was idyllic and bucolic and mm. jolly nice, we moved to Dulwich, um, to a huge Victorian house, huge Victorian house, um, a villa owned by Dulwich College. And mm. we went to a really violent and difficult school called Oakfield, um, which was a rude awakening um, into the rough and tumble of the playground and, um, and survival. Um, so probably it was an extremely salutary experience. Mm. Um, I think um, we both, because my sister went to the girls' bit and I went to the boys' bit, she was two years older than me, um, and uh, I think we both hated it from start to finish. Um, and it was vile, and there was bullying, and um, there, was, there, were, there were all sorts of ghastly incidents. I remember a friend of mine called John Ford, who stepped on an iron spike, and I, remember, I can still see, that's another vivid memory, the spike coming through his foot in the playground. Quite ghastly. But of course, that sort of thing, in those days, we lived in a sort of, we lived among bomb sites in Budlia, and, um, and uh, school was, was tough and hateful. And... Um, that took you through to yeah. what age? Took me through to that the age of. Took me through to the age of eight. When we moved to, we moved from Dulwich to North Kensington to a very slummy part of North Kensington, and which was better for my father because he could he was working at St Mary's, um, and um, for one memorable term. I went to the school that my mother had been to called the Norland Place in Holland Park Avenue. And there, for the first time, I encountered girls um, who fell in love. And <laughs> it was just one term. Mm. And it was, it, was, it was green and blue and beautiful. <laughs> and, you know, I, I never forgot how wonderful life could be. Um, and then, at the end of that term, I was ripped away, because this was what, the way things were going to be, and sent to my first boarding school, um, to a place called Southey Hall in Surrey. Um, which was Southey. Southey, yeah, Southey, Southey, Hall. Southey Hall, Robert Southey. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, there I encountered Latin and... Uh, uh, matron and dormitories mm -hmm. and, and it was it was all right it was horrible leaving home mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I was very homesick and uh, uh, what happened um, any teachers that you yes I, I, I turned out to be extremely good at Latin um, and um, a man called Mr. MacDonald uh, adopted me as a sort of favourite child um, and and nurtured my excellence at Latin. By contrast, I was hopeless at maths, and um, uh, I had a succession of teachers who despaired of me. Um, but it was a traditional English prep school, um, uh, of a very ancient kind, and it collapsed after I'd been there about two years, um, the headmaster had a financial, uh, a, a nervous breakdown, which um, presumably the financial was mm -hmm. the reason, um, and everything just collapsed like a house of cards. And 
in a way, that was, that was awful for me because I'd grown very fond. It's curious because I never thought of this before, but when I was at Norland, I, I made very strong friendships with um, girls and boys, but the girls were very important to me. Um, and then at, at Southey Hall, I made one or two really strong friendships um, which I valued intensely. And then the school collapsed and we were, a group of us were sent away to another prep school. We amalgamated with another one in Berkshire. But my special friends didn't come and I never saw them again, ever. And that I hated and I still resented quite a lot. Um, you know, the, not even a glimpse of there was, no, there was no way that one could somehow communicate with them. Mm. No, no Facebook in those days. No, no Facebook. You know, that was it. But anyway, the other school, the, and, and in comparison, the, the, the other school was rather pathetic. Mm. Um, it didn't have the sort of, sort, of, sort of fairly Victorian customs of this other place, which made it seem rather grand and interesting. Um, uh, my Latin improved, my French was good, my Mathematics was appalling, and um, I went from there uh, back to London to St Paul's, um, and that's where um, uh, that's where I spent the remainder of my school days in London. And I have to say that apart from the Norland and occasionally at Southey Hall, I suppose I hated every minute that I was at school. Disliked school intensely. Um, why? Yes, why? Um, <laughs> I think it was partly that all of these schools, again with the exception of the Norland, were based on fear. Um, they and and I think that that's something that that persists in middle class life in England to some extent. This fear of um, failure this fear of deadlines, this fear of not succeeding. But, I mean, the, 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 the fear initially was just sort of naked fear of being beaten, um, and that went on until the end of my time at St Paul's. Um, you were beaten? Oh, yes, yes, quite a lot. Um, uh, but I think the really debilitating thing about school was that life was never real. That's to say, life was always postponed. Um, the next important thing was to pass common entrance, and then things would start. Then it was O-levels, and then. But no, it wasn't, it was A-levels, and then. And when you got to university, to an extent, life did begin. It had been postponed endlessly. And fear and discipline and, and institutionalization mm. was what was so hateful about it. And so I remember actually swearing a great oath to myself in, in on the, what we grandly called the parade ground at St Paul's. Um, that I would never, ever, ever, whatever else happened to me, however low things, however bad things became, I would never, ever become a schoolmaster. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> no, it probably won't now. No, I don't think it will. Um, but on the other hand, on the other hand, St Paul's was extremely influential for me. Um, um, because... I went there with the idea that I would become a diplomat. I was going to go into the Foreign Service, this seems a very good idea. I was told that that was an excellent ambition to have, um, but that it would require a great deal of hard work, and that I would have to get a scholarship to university, and I would have to be brilliant. And I sort of subsided back at the thought of all that. And um, I did French, and I did Latin, and I did history, 
and I did English and I did German and I excelled at all of those and with mathematics I was abominable and um, at O level I got through everything and at that point you had to decide and uh, you had to decide what you were going to specialise in. So I said, I want to specialise in modern languages because that's what I'm good at. Um, and I manifestly was. And I said, I would like to do Italian and Russian as well as French and German. And they said, oh, well, that's just too bad because we don't teach Italian and Russian. <laughs> and actually, you can do, you can continue with French and German if you wish although we don't encourage it, um, but you should do history. And I said, I was absolutely, for the first time in my life, I was really outraged about what was being done to me. And uh, I, I told them that I would have nothing to do with their history. And I had seen, through a window, people in white coats cutting up dogfish. And I had thought that these were the most outrageous and interesting people in the school. And they were cool. And, and this would be the thing to do. So I said to them, to hell with your history. I will not do it. I will do biology. And they were absolutely appalled. They, the powers that be, and there was quite an array of them. And huge pressure was brought to bear on me. Um, I mean, I think quite improperly. Um, they told me that, that this was quite out of the question, that I had a brilliant future ahead of me, that I was throwing it away, that I would disappear down the black hole of science and never be seen or heard of again. And um, for some reason, I think because I was just, I had actually got it into my head that I really wanted to do this. I said, no, I'm going to do this. Um, and, and I did, and they were right. Um, it was awful. I did disappear down the black hole of science. And, and I was... I was already known to be useless at mathematics and I was therefore useless at chemistry and useless at physics. I was pretty good at biology. Um, I enjoyed that enormously. I couldn't understand what physics and chemistry was about. It was a totally foreign language because up to that point I had not had any science whatever. And then suddenly you start learning about ions and valency and um, all these funny things that go on. And it was... It was, it was actually like beginning Latin. It was incomprehensible, and I could not get my head round that way of thinking. Whereas biology was much gentler. It was about birds and bees and flowers and worms and dissecting dogfish, which we did do. And um, gradually one became aware that, that these sort of chemical reactions that we were hearing about were actually important for biology and that but I don't think it was until I got to Cambridge, uh, well, rather Oxford, um, until I got to university that I discovered that actually physics had something to do with biology. Um, but uh, the good fortune about all this was that my the, 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 the teacher, the biology teacher of St Paul's, was an inspirational and very peculiar man called Pask, Sidney Pask. Is that P A S K? P A S K, and he taught Jonathan Miller as well. And I think uh, that Jonathan Miller also thought that he was inspirational. Um, but for me, he was quite outstanding. He he brought to teaching, um, and he was an extremely bluff and and difficult man. But he brought to teaching. Um, children who had been up to that point used to having things told to them. He brought to them the idea of not knowing, 
not understanding, um, thinking about what one wanted to do next. Um, and he had a very subtle, although perhaps one might in retrospect think that it wasn't subtle, way of encouraging you. Because at the end of the first year, when I moved on from his class to the next sort of level, but would eventually come back for my third and final year into his class. Um, but at the end of that first year, he wrote on our reports, he wrote, he sort of, he sort of summarised where he thought we were going. And he said on my report, and on several others, he said, um, should um, attempt university scholarship in another two years and this to me was bizarre I mean I thought that I was hopeless I thought I was completely useless that I was a failure and um, that um, I mean I had no idea what my future was, go was going to be uh, at all uh, I had no idea but university really wasn't featuring me. and uh, there was this man saying, not only that I should uh, uh, apply for a scholarship, I should try for a scholarship, but I should go to Oxford or Cambridge. And um, this transformed, um, transformed my view of what was possible. And I began to work. Um, and uh, so I worked hard in the subsequent year and um, had the good fortune to have a rather um, uh, frank, and, and friendly New Zealander called Mr. McKellar to teach me physics. Um, and his view was that biologists were completely hopeless at physics and anything quantitative, and therefore we would concentrate on things that didn't involve numbers. And that way we would get you through. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> so that was enormously, um, enormously helpful. And then I came back to biology in my third year. I mean, came back to sort of seriously studying that and chemistry. And, um, and, and Mr. Pask was, was, was just extraordinarily good at getting us to think about things. And it was just wonderful. He would sit there, and I mean, quite unlike what we would... What, uh, I mean, he looked like an... Looked like a, a sort of English army major, I think. I think he was major <laughs> at one point, actually. But he looked like that. He had very, he had a very sort of bullet head and bullish sort of mm. appearance. And he would sit there, sort of chomping at the bit, and sort of he sort of played around with the sponge that he was going to wipe the rat for. And he'd say, "What should we talk about today? What should we do today?" And then we wouldn't say anything because we didn't know what we were going to talk about today. <laughs> and he would just sit there and he would wait. He'd just wait. And we, were, and we were in awe of him, and then somebody would, somebody would start. And actually, in the end, we invented a game amongst ourselves where we would attempt to go through the whole alphabet, um, uh, asking questions with a different letter hmm. for the beginning of the question in one lesson. Um, and this worked, this worked brilliantly with him. I'm sure he was aware of what was going on, but it worked wonderfully. <laughs> um, so I had a good, good, good time with him. Um, one other question I always mm. ask about school is mm. um, any other kind of hobby or games or sports or anything. That well, I was hopeless at games, hopeless, except for rugby, which I was good at. Um, what but was I was it? What too place small. did you, you play? I played half. I was, no, I was the hooker. Really? Strangely yeah. enough, I was mm. the hooker. And that started at prep school. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I think the good thing about rugger was that when I started it, the school was starting it, so nobody quite knew what to do, so we had to teach ourselves rugger. Whereas when it came to cricket and football, um, I had never received any instruction in these sports, and never did. So you were just expecting, as an Englishman, to know how to play cricket, and so you just <laughs> marched out there with a bat and failed over and over <laughs> again, and you dropped catches and generally were hopeless. And the same with football, I was completely hopeless. And, but at rug, rugger, I enjoyed it because I actually did enjoy um, uh, throwing myself at people and tackling them and just Ooh. generally being brutish. And it was it was lovely. I was good at it, um, and I could see the point of the game. So when I went on to St Paul's, I was put into the under 14s 
um, as the hooker. And after a bit, the very charming man who, who ran that bit of the sports side took me on one side and said, look, I'm afraid you're just not big enough. You know, you're not built for this game and you're going to get damaged. And so I think you're going to have to drop it. So that was the end of rugby for me. Uh, I mean, I continued to play it, but not in, you know, not in a, in any well, serious perhaps way. Perhaps it saved you from certain death. Anyway. Well, it probably did, yes. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. that, so sports were hopeless. Um, I was surprisingly good at, in the combined cadet force. Hmm. I discovered a, a capacity for ordering people around. And, and actually, I think that that related to... Uh, certain sort of theatrical leanings. I mean, I was quite. I was uh, at Oxford. I, I became an actor, um, and that, together with what I'd done in the corps, uh, sort of marching people around and pretending to be a sergeant major, was extremely helpful when it came to lecturing, because one was, uh, what you were, you were aware that this was just a performance, and so that it wasn't. I mean, that was what was important. You had to perform. Um, to begin with, at least that was really that was really important. Um, what about ornithology or an animals? A lot of scientists I talked to. No, no. I mean, I was a I was a rather keen natural historian, but not in any sort of organised or um, mm. sort of collecting kind of way. Mm. I at this house in in Wales, we there was one could always potter off and and. Uh, I mean, we were constantly surrounded by, by living things, um, including, I suppose, I mean, I always think of things like, like damming streams and, and sort of chasing field mice and, and sort of generally, and, and fishing. Uh, there was a lake there, which was wonderful. That, that actually, when I come to think of it, was probably quite influential, this lake, because it was so mysterious and so full of the most wonderful things. And my father encouraged me to, to collect newts and sticklebacks and things and put them in tanks and look at them. So, so that was a beginning there. Uh, it certainly, I mean, that was the sort of thing about biology that I loved, this sort of sense of, of um, this wonderful sort of watery world, living, whirling, transparent. That's what I loved. And I think that's why I really wanted to be a biologist. Um, so, yeah, but, but apart from uh, at school, no, I was pretty hopeless, actually. I mean, I really was. I was, a, I was weedy and uh, slightly scholarly. And uh, the most awful thing that happened to me was when a new high master appeared who was um, a liberal. Um, his name was Hulloth. We'd had a very, a very sort of straight-laced man called Jilks before that, um, who was very much sort of straight down the line, beat the high off him. Um, and uh, then came Hulloth, and Hulloth um, thought that he would sort of bring in a bright new future for the school, and I'm sure his, his intentions were entirely admirable, but he made me a prefect on the basis that intellectual excellence should be rewarded as well as physical prowess. So here was this titchy little thing, <laughs> <laughs> desperately trying to exert his authority over muscly adolescents. And that was ghastly. That was quite ghastly. <laughs> and made my hatred of school even worse. So, um, and another thing, that's another thing, actually, that was another thing that was deeply, deeply influential in my life. Because I was in London, and I was a day boy, therefore, and wasn't a boarder. I had an intense life outside school. And by the stage when I was, I suppose, 15, 16, the Aldermaston marches had begun. And uh, I went on an Aldermaston march briefly from Kensington High Street to Trafalgar Square and was... And, 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 and actually went and saw, I mean, this sounds pathetic, but I went and saw on the beach with um, one of the Ackland uh, children, um, Robert Ackland, I think it was. Um, and that was just a 
transforming moment for me. I mean, I was so outraged at the possibility of nuclear annihilation and so on and so forth. But I became an absolutely rabid nuclear disarmer, as well as going and visiting RAF Wittering and seeing um, this as part of the cadet corps, um, seeing what they claimed was a hydrogen bomb. No, an atom bomb, I think. Um, but so, so the, during my school life, in the latter part, I became extremely rebellious um, and uh, formed a lot of very uh, good friendships um, amongst the sort of nuclear disarmament uh, community, I suppose it was. Mm -hmm.